<laughs> supposed, you're supposed to, we're supposed to go off on some kind of tangent. <laughs> but I, I think I have everything I need. Mm-hmm. If, if I if I don't, I know where you live. Yeah. <laughs> and that's on tape. <laughs> don't do, don't destroy this evidence, Dan. <laughs> My gun is broken. My gun is broken. From Huntsville, Alabama, you are listening to My Code is Broken, a podcast by developers for everybody. Here is your host, Dan Nagel. My gun is broken. My gun is broken. Greetings, my fellow nerds. I'm trying a new format this time around. There is no audio essay. There is just too much content this time around. Instead, I have for you a very solid hour of interviews. If you hate it, well, you can have the next episode for free. In the meantime, feel free to blast me about it on Twitter at NagelCode. Today's episode is about conference planning, particularly developer-oriented conferences. People who attend conferences fall into three categories those who may attend if it's nearby and cheap, then there are those who enjoy it so much that they actually volunteer as unpaid speakers. I fall into this group. Then there are those who actually invest their own personal time and money, ranging from several hundred to several thousand dollars, to actually organize and launch these money-losing conferences just so we can enjoy them. Why do they do this? It's a fascinating topic, and I'm very fortunate to have interviewed two conference chairmen. I'm bringing both to this episode. The inaugural Dev Space Conference was the brainchild of Chris Gardner. Barcamp Huntsville, now in its second year, was launched by Jason Sumner. Both are tech-oriented, both are trying to support their communities, both have very different styles. I talked to Chris first and Jason second, but you'll hear from each interwoven throughout the episode. First up is Chris. Why did you launch DevSpace? I launched DevSpace because I saw... I, I've been in the community speaking at conferences primarily all over the, the East Coast, but also some on the West Coast for years and years and years. And it was, why isn't there something like that here? The closest thing there was to a Huntsville conference was in Chattanooga for DevLink. And I would occasionally see some Huntsville people there on minor occasions, I'd see one or two people up in Knoxville for code stock, but I'd never see any of them really at any other location. How many conferences do you go to a year? I try to make at least six conferences, and then I'll try to hit up two or three users groups as as I can, depending on where I am and, and what I can do. Is this just something you do because you're interested in going to conferences? You like talking or how, to, how does I, I really love well it's twofold one I really love the community aspect and getting around other people with like-minded ideas that think in a similar train of thought because if you're speaking to a non-technical person there's a certain amount of guardedness you have to have to your language not because of saying something bad or anything like that but because you have to be careful not to go over their head and waste time setting up your train of thought and et cetera, et cetera. When you're speaking to somebody who is already technically minded, there are certain assumptions you can make about the way they think and process information, and you can just jump straight into the good part of the conversation. So there's that aspect of community that I know is really great. On top of the fact that I'm just passionate about what I do and I love to share that passion. I love to share that passion with other people. And speaking at the conferences gives me a a point to say, here's this thing I really love. Maybe I can inspire some passion in you. And at the same point in time, I get to see these other people talk about the topics they're passionate about and go, oh, I never looked at that or I never thought about that. So let me go and play around with these ideas. So between the two of those, it's just a wonderful experience. Is this also why you teach at UAH? That's a part of it. Um, I, I love the teaching at UAH because it gives me a chance to hit the people young and let them see that there's a world out there beyond just what academia does to you. Uh, when I 
started out of high school doing computer science programs. I just had a horrible experience, compounded by the fact that I managed into my first job somewhere in the middle of my sophomore-ish year and saw the way the real industry was operating and the way academics was operating and going, there's this huge disparity there. And it wasn't for years later until I looped back around and, and appreciated what the comp sci degree was doing. So when I got the offer to go into UAH, especially teaching lower level classes, I'm teaching intro to programming in the spring. So, so this is so it, it 100, gives, 200 classes? 100, 200 level classes. It gives me a chance to hit the people going, hey, this is what you're going to get going forward with comp sci. Here's how it relates to real world. This is the way the real life community reacts. And I can kind of give them that light at the end of the tunnel, which a lot of the full-time professors, and I'm not knocking them, but some of these people have been teaching and they've never had a real job in industry in their entire life. Uh, and the way academics think about code and computer science right. topics is greatly different from a guy that's just got to get code out the door. <laughs> that's, that's my world. <laughs> Got to get code out the door. That's right. Oh, my gosh. DevSpace aims to be premier developer conference, five tracks, two-day event, and a convention center. Tickets are $90 at the door. Barcamp is also developer-oriented, though it is styled very different. It's a free one-day event, often at a bar. Let's hear Jason Sumner's origin story. Why did you launch Barcamp? I originally moved up here from... Uh, Orlando, Florida, and the company that I worked for there sponsored the local bar camp in Orlando. So I got to participate and, as, as, you know, go and see people talk and, you know, listen to everything. And I always thought it was an, an awesome idea. It kind of opened my eyes to a lot of different technology and, you know, people doing things differently, people asking different questions, people trying to solve different, you know, issues and that I was facing in a mainly infrastructure role. Um, you know, we you know the data center hosted other people's applications, so it was always also nice to kind of keep on top of, you know, what people were developing on, and you know what technologies they were using, what was kind of coming around the corner, uh, so I could support it. So I moved up here uh, to take a uh, government contracting job, and saw that there was a lot of other technology stuff going on. I mean, you when know, did you move here? Uh, Two thousand eleven. It was, 2011 was the year of the tornadoes. Yes, April yeah. 27, 2011. Yeah, so I was supposed to start that Monday following the tornadoes, and then I got told to not come up here. So, um, you know, held off a little bit, but came up here, you know, lived up here a year by myself while my wife stayed down in Florida. So, needless to say, I had a lot of free time wow. during the nights and stuff like that. So, you know, start finding user groups online, you know, starting to see a lot of the events, you know, a couple technology companies around the town were, were putting on and would go out to those. And so I saw the community was here, but I, didn't ever, I never saw an event that brought everyone together. Um, so in 2013, I started the idea and I, I kind of lost steam, you know, didn't really know what venues to go to. I wasn't that familiar with downtown. Um, so 2014 is when we kind of started yeah. Right. I noticed that it looked like you had the beginnings of like a Twitter account and the website and then it just you just didn't quite get it together. Yeah. And then twenty fourteen was full steam ahead. Yeah, it it was a little bit of a, a daunting task of not knowing the the people that were ran the user groups all the user groups, um, you know, my, my job was different at the time, uh, you know, doing network support, I was on call, you know, nights and weekends, and things were, you know, more time consuming, I would say, and as kind of my job progressed, I got into a role that was, you know, not every, not every job is a true 9 to 5, but more of a 9 to 5, I didn't have a on-call cell phone, I didn't have anything like that to worry about, so I really had some dedicated time to, to mo or to dedicate to bar camp, so I decided to just hit the streets and get it done. Now, bar camp says it's a technology unconference. What's an unconference? 
So, I mean, I will explain that by explaining what a conference normally is. So, I mean, a conference, you know, normally you have a set schedule in place. Um, you know, it's, it's very structured. It's very, very formalized. And, you know, to me, you're kind of stuck in a room. Every time I go to a conference and, and the speaker's talking and the talk starts to go away that I don't like it, I just kind of, out of being nice, I kind of stay in the room and I don't get the, you know, the, the value out of that talk per se. And, and, and it's nothing, you know, against the talk or the content or the speaker himself. It's just from my, my perspective, I'm not getting that value out of it. So, you know, the unconference is, you know, the, the people there decide the, the schedule. So, you know, this last year we had a voting system that allowed people to identify what talks they wanted, and that basically set the schedule. And then after right. that, you I still didn't. Have... I didn't really notice a voting system for year one. Was did that just not make it in, and you got it into year two? Um, it was a little bit of didn't get it in, but more. I'd say about seventy percent more of a going into the unknown. So I, I did go against the grain on a on t- typical unconference and the bar camp, you know, structure by getting presenters and kind of having, you know, book time slots. But I did it as openly as possible. So I, I put it out there. I went to the user groups. I, I hit Twitter. Uh, any any form that I could get it out there, I got it out there. And the people that, that spoke were people that kind of just came. I didn't do like a call for papers. I didn't turn anyone away, you know, at first. I just, you know, whoever wanted to speak their mind by any, anything technology related, I, I just let them speak. Was the focus intentional to be technology? Because I noticed for year one, there was a lot of just um, yay community type talks. Um, there was a little bit of that. Um, you know, the, the people that maybe had stepped up first to, to talk had other communities that they were, you know, you know, supporting or, or getting going. Um, but I mean, I would say that there was a fair amount of, you know, technical talks the first year as well. Yeah, I would just say that that without having that voting system in place the first year, it didn't kind of curtail to more technology because I think the second year we had more technology talks than we did yeah. the first year. So. Second year, it seemed to be nearly 100% or close to 100% technology. Yeah. Was that was that your original vision to strong technology focus? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, technology is kind of a broad term, so it kind of encompasses everything. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to kind of create a, a programming conference kind of like Dev Space. I wanted to kind of let, you know, they have their focus, you know, to do it. You know, the B-Sides conference coming up is, you know, technology security related. Um, you know, this wanted to be kind of just a blend because, you know, we'd like to call ourselves programmers and systems engineers and network guys, and we all kind of pigeon ourselves into different things, but right. technology is moving in a way that all that's being blending. I mean, you know, software-defined radios to diversely created web applications. I mean, you know, it's just not HTML anymore. It's it's more of a, you know, software development, right. you know, effort now. And so there's a lot of technologies that are blending over, and for someone that maybe a web developer by trade may not pick up on some some things that that may introduce them to because it's it's more I, I try to make it more about connections and you know getting people talking is the reason why you went through the free track at the bar type conference versus one I mean again it's it's the kind of to get people talking you know again we kind of spend a lot of time online and you know there's great meetups um, you know that bring people together, but there is not a lot of. I guess there there is now, but you know before I didn't really see any cross blending of user groups, um, and and just any type of event that would draw people out. But once you're at the event, you know, again conferences being very formal, you're going from track to track. You know you don't have that time to, you know you don't feel like you could approach the speaker. You don't feel like you could you know approach another attendee and ask those questions um, that may come up. You know, but with some social lubricant, you know, that is beer, you know, you can have, you know, people are a little more open to talking. And I think just that allows information to be shared and, you know, it betters the community um, in, in the long run than just. Okay. I'm interested in the 
you setting the prize to free. Because I, I visualize that once you put the free prize tag on there, that just throws a huge wild card into your planning and scheduling because it's such a it's a, such a low bandwidth to click you know RSVP then never show up because you don't have any skin in the game. Yeah. Um, was it was that a problem? It it, it has been a problem because you know both years uh, we had about a you know ninety to a hundred people register or RSVP for the event. Um, the first year we had about fifty uh, events and. I say about 50 because there were people that didn't check in. They just kind of came to the, you know, the scene or to, to one of the bars. Um, so it kind of, I wasn't able to keep a head count. Uh, we had 63 at the second year. So it was a little bit of a, an improvement on the, on the um, attendees. Uh, but it does, make it, it does make it difficult. You know, the second year we were able to, to have uh, some sponsors come in on board and support the event, which is great because it allowed us to do some things like the free beer, uh, the free food, um, but again, expecting a hundred people and getting sixty, you know, over planning, overcompensating for some, you know, expenses and trying to get, you know, food trucks involved. You say, hey, I, I want you to come down and feed a, a group of a hundred people, and you know, they have their expectations. So it, there is a little bit of that, but that being said, I, I I still would rather have the people that turn out turn out because they're they're all great and they all participated in making Bar Camp better. Um, but I don't want anyone to ever be discouraged because they don't want to spend $10 on, on this or you know whatever the, whatever the price tag is. I don't want that to be a barrier to, to entry for someone to come out, be introduced to the community, be a part of the community, and um, you know, hopefully get involved in Bar Camp and those type of things. Choosing the correct price for whatever you're selling is a topic that has consumed volumes of books. It just depends on your goal. I'm involved in the B-Sides conference development, and our conference is $10. It is low enough to where, if someone wants to go, they should be able to. It is just high enough that not too many would RSVP and not show. We sold out last year, and we still lost money. I wasn't directly involved in the finances, but my best guess is a few hundred dollars. We simply ate that cost and are pressing on for year three. Starting a conference is usually a money loser, Yet, the organizers keep going. Let's jump back to Chris. How much of uh, the money loss, and do you mind saying how much? Oh, you're going to make me say it. Yeah, I'll say it. Uh, I'm about seven grand out of pocket. Okay. Seven grand out. How much of that is a demotivator going into year two? Because I assume you're, you're going to do a year two. There will be a year two. Um, had I not had the response I got from year one, and this is in two different ways, um, there was a lot of learning here. There was a, we didn't get some of the numbers we wanted. We didn't get this, that, and the other. The original budget for the grand scheme I had was about ten. Oh, no, I'm sorry, about a hundred thousand uh, dollars. We ended up our bills at the end ended up being about twenty five thousand dollars. That's how much we scaled back from the original idea. You were. You are going to put together $100,000. We were shooting for the moon year one oh because if you God. shoot for the moon, you might get to a star. Um, that, that would have been quite the conference. Right. So, But we put that out there. And then as we were dealing with sponsors, the biggest thing we got from a lot of sponsors was we really love the idea and we're behind the concept full force, but we're not going to sponsor you for year one because you're this unknown entity. Do a good job year one. Talk to us next year. And we'll be more than happy to fund you. On top of the fact that due to, due to self-fundraising money to buy business licenses and start some of the paperwork you need, I didn't get started on the call for sponsors until much later than I wanted to. And, and some of them just said, we've already allocated all of our money for the year. Now that we have everything in place and we have a track record, I can come back to these people and say, and have realistic goals of budgets. I can come back to these people and say, here's the sponsorship levels we need. We pulled off year one. Here was the community response. Let's move forward. And so I, I'm less apprehensive about going in the whole year two because of the response we got from year one. So the premier sponsorship package was $10,000. $10,000. You had a public on those sites, so I'll go ahead and say yep. it. Well, if, if we do get the nonprofit status, all of our financials have to be public anyway so right. there's no hiding it so you lost seven thousand dollars i presume 
if Deal News didn't sponsor, you would be 17000 in the hole? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know if it would have happened if Deal News didn't sponsor. Um, we lost our original venue because we couldn't get funding to secure a venue in time. Originally, we were going to do it at the West End at Bridge Street because it's got everything right there for after hours and whatnot. And due to us not being able to put the deposit down to secure the time slot and some other things I won't go into, we ended up losing the reservation to somebody else. Uh, and I got the VBC at the last second, which is one of the reasons why we're in the North Hall on the second floor and that wedding was going on in the first floor was because I had to find a location in a hurry that could meet the timing we wanted. And they were great with working with us when they actually... They actually pencil, penciled us in before I had the deposit and said, we'll work with you as, as penciled in. If somebody comes forward and wants that space before you get a chance to actually, to actually put it on your deposit, we will give you a call. We will say some other people are interested in the space. We'll give you a, a reasonable period of time to try to immediately give us a deposit, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, I mean... Do you think the conference would have happened if you didn't find the, your premier sponsor? Uh, I've been on record in other places saying the conference was going to happen if I had to do it in, like, the conference room of somebody's office. So it may have happened, but it wouldn't, probably wouldn't have been as nice. Right. Okay. You know, it, if could it, was, a, it could have happened in my living room with me making sandwiches in my kitchen, but it was going to happen. Well, thank you, Deal News. <laughs> a fairly large slice of Chris's $7,000 undoubtedly went to renting a slice of the Von Braun Convention Center and buying food. Bar Camp Year One was literally at a couple bars. A ceiling-mounted TV had an HDMI cable dangling from it, and a restaurant table was pulled up for the speaker to connect his laptop and props. So with venue and cost removed, guess what? Launching a conference is still expensive. Here's Jason. Do you mind saying how much you lost on each conference? Um, the first year, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you. Um, I remember at one point for the first conference, you said $500. Yeah, because... Does that sound about right? Yeah, because the, the first year, you know, in, as an enticement to try and get... Um, you know, speakers. I, I did give out pint glasses with the Bar Camp logo on it. Yeah, I've got mine. It's nice. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to the speakers, um, I had to buy you know some AV equipment. So the the bars, you know, as most bars do, have flat screen TVs. So I had to go get like HDMI cables, duplicators, um, that type of stuff. Um, uh, coasters that we used as you know um, name tags. Um, that all that had to be purchased. Um, you know, the website, you know, those costs kind of like trickle in. Um, and I just bought those as, as you know, needed. Uh, the, the second year was a little bit better. Again, we had, uh, you know, sponsors come on board that, you know, help, you know, provide, uh, you know, a discounted price on things and, and actually provide monetary, you know, you know value to it. So the, the second year, I, did, I, didn't, I may have lost maybe 50 bucks. I mean, but it was, again, buying you know, buying the name tags and that type of stuff, which right. isn't overly expensive for under people. Chris's point about having a good track record rings true. It makes the next year cheaper. Jason cut his losses by 90%. I call that success. After a minus $7,000 year, my guess is Chris would actually be pleased if his dev space year two ended at just minus 700 one major slice missing from all these expenses is personal effort. Just how much is your time worth? I didn't put a per dollar amount on it, but I tried to tally their time. I'm not the person in charge, but my time spent helping B-sides hit roughly five hours a week as the conference neared. Let's hear first from Chris about Dev Space and then Jason about Bar Camp. Say you were an hourly employee punching in, punching out and you were to go back and add up your time clock, how much time do you think you would have spent preparing this conference? I don't know if I can answer that question. The, it, it was a full-time job on top of my other full-time job. I'll say that much. You had, um, you had two jobs. I, I, well, the big joke with me was that is 
at one point in time in the middle of the planning of it, I quit my normal day job without any other plans. And at, to me, it was funny because me quitting my job and being unemployed meant I was down to only two and a half jobs, which is rare for me. I've always got my hands in 10 million things, probably more than I should. And that's another one of those things where if I hadn't done that, I don't know if it would have happened because without that block of time that opened up. So you losing your job was obviously a financial hit to you, but it was a boon to us who like to go to conferences because dev space emerged. Yes. I, I was fortunate when I quit my job because I'm just this much of a workaholic. I had something like 350 vacation hours built up. So the, the, after I gave my two weeks notice and they had to pay me out my back vacation, I had a buffer to live off for a while. And I was doing some contracting to help bring in some additional funds. But yeah, there was, there was some tight moments in there where it was, you know, I, I don't know if I would have been able to do it if I didn't have the non-full-time job where I can run around town during the day and get lots of things set up. Uh, but there was a real issue with funding and everything and, I just, I just, I, I hate to use this word, but I just had to have faith, for lack of better terms, that if I kept moving, if you build it, they will come and do what I have to. Did the sponsorships come in after you left your job and you were able to uh, hit them a lot harder? Oh, yeah. Okay. Was that when you got your premier sponsor? Was after you left your job? Yes. Quick note about Chris's vacation time payout. He was lucky. It may vary by location, but at least in Huntsville, an employer is not required to pay out unused vacation time if you voluntarily leave. Consult your HR department about what happens, covertly if possible. Anyway, same question to Jason. If you were to say this was a, an hourly job, you're clocking in and out, what do you think that time clock would say for the organization of bar camp year one and year two it would be a part part-time job for you know the the first six months leading up to it with the exception of that that month out the month out is you know when you start really you know hammering down on lining up the, the food and you know kind of getting those agreements in place um, just getting some of the finishing touches so would you say maybe um, five hours a week for four months and then 10, 15 hours a week for the month of? Yeah, and then... Were you were you more efficient for year two? Yes, um, you know, uh, Lance over, you know, BizTech had made it extremely easy on me, you know, having everything kind of there in the, in the, in the, in the building. So I um, was able to kind of, in a couple meetings, kind of get an understanding of what was needed. Uh, he got everything lined up for me, and then the day before, being able to set up and, you know, knocking it out the day of the event and then cleaning up the next day. So probably about 30 hours but on those three days. <laughs> and talking to the organizers about their challenges, both cited difficulty with marketing and spreading the word, but for different reasons. First, let's hear from Chris. Speaking of attendance... And this is from my own personal view. Uh, I thought Dev Space just was not marketed very well. I knew about it because I knew you. But as far as my Facebook feed, my Twitter, LinkedIn, I barely saw a mention of it. I'm wondering if that's partly because you have a very understandable aversion to Facebook and LinkedIn. Or is this just something that you're so busy it just kind of fell through? I, I, one, of the, one of the takeaways we did learn was that I am horrible at marketing. Um, and, and I've been joking about that, even though it's not a joke, for the past month now, that one of the lessons learned from DevSpace is that I am horrible at marketing. We did have a Facebook page. It didn't come up until the last second. Uh, yeah, there was no LinkedIn activity. I was hitting Twitter for the past year. I never could find a way to get the Twitter account connected to the right people to make it spread. I tried a couple things, never could get it in there. We didn't have the budget for traditional advertising. We, we definitely want to put the marketing more in the forefront for next year, 
uh, and hopefully the word of mouth now will help a lot more too. The Yield News helped a little bit, but it seemed like even they got a really late start. They got a really late start. They actually found a marketing person to hook us up with at the last second. Uh, we did manage to to get an interview with Way 31, but because of a miscommunication, we were on the wrong broadcast, so it wasn't a good time to hit people. Just There were lots of errors made in the marketing of the conference. Do you think that marketing may have been the one of the biggest shortfall, pitfall, what's the right word? Undoubtedly. Because every... At one point in time during the conference, I ran into somebody who I absolutely didn't know, which at the point with the number of attendees that were there, honestly surprised me that we got random people. Uh, somebody who came in from Atlanta who had kind of heard a little bit of buzz off of a Twitter feed or something and checked out the conference and looked at the list of speakers and was like, wow, this is really incredible. And so just came up completely on his own and then was 100% surprised when he got here based on the quality of the speakers and everything else that this was year one, which to me was a great compliment as far as what we pulled off as far as the technical and conference sense. But it also says that if we got one random guy, if we had really gotten the word out, what could we have really done? So I 100% agree that the marketing was our, our biggest downfall, and that will definitely be a priority for year two. Uh, marketing ain't free. And now Jason's experience with event promotion. Before jumping into this, I would like to point out that he is correct. Bar Camp Year 2 basically advertised itself based on the success of Year 1. They're putting this together, what do you... What was hurting you the most? Uh, money, time, or motivation? Money and uh, the fourth option would be, you know, contacts, you know. Um, right, because you moved here in, you said, 2011? Mm -hmm. And within Bar Camp 2014, was that the first one? That was the first one that I actually pulled off. I had planned on doing it in 2013, but... That's a rather short amount of time to throw together a conference without any, without a Rolodex to help you out. Yeah. Um, but it just had to be one of those things that had to get done. And, you know, I, I've met a lot of, you know, great people, you know, over the years. And, you know, that, that definitely made it, in terms of getting speakers and things like that, the second year um, made that a lot easier. And, you know, just getting the word out for attendance and that type of thing, you know, made it a lot easier. You know, so as, as you were saying, you know, the third and fourth year, all that stuff's going to get, you know, generally easier. And, you know, if you have a great event, you know, people will put it on their calendars and want to come back, right. you know. Or did you attack it with the mentality that Chris had the mentality of, I absolutely have to have a year one. Where did that hit your, get in your mind saying, okay, I've got to have a year one. And then year two will be easier and year three will be easier. Did you have have that kind of strategy going at it? Um, the, the the first one I definitely did because it was two, three, four times a week going during lunch to the lunch and learns around town. The, the a couple of user groups have you know Is going this for promotion. Yeah, for promotion. You know, just trying to get people interested in you know speaking at the events. You know, e even just coming to the events um, and and trying to you know do the old street team technique of you know feet on the ground and hand-to-hand, -hand, you know, handshakes get, you know, deals done. So mm -hmm. I was just trying to get out there and be known because, you know, like a lot of people in Huntsville, I'm, I'm a transient. I came from, you know, from Florida. So, you know, I just had to meet people to introduce, introduce myself and get the event going. Our biggest problem with B-Studs marketing is probably that our chairman is traveling 90% of the time. The organizer is the best advertiser. Therefore, I often volunteer to speak at user groups and I throw in a B-Sides promo slide. We're still a couple months out and our ticket sales seem to spike in the final two weeks. Okay, let's jump past the planning phase and into the conference post-mortem. We'll hear from Chris first. So year one is done and I was there. I, I thought it was great. And I was going through the conference, going to each talks, and I thought the whole thing just went very smoothly. But knowing you, knowing the amount of personal effort you put into it, 
was there a facade going where everything looks really great on the outside, me going through, and are you running around with your ha- hair on fire because you're trying to pull off pretty much this whole thing yourself? Uh, well, I wasn't trying to pull it off myself. I did have two people that were helping me uh, there. And, and to back up a little bit about that, I'm almost fortunate about this because I was almost at the point at, you know, a couple back in the beginning of the year where I'm like, I'm going to end up doing this on my own. Um, fortunately, legally speaking, to become a nonprofit, you have to be a nonprofit corporation that files for federal nonprofit exemption. And to be a nonprofit organization, you have to have a board of directors with at least three people. So legally, I couldn't do it alone. Uh, there was some struggles of finding some people who shared my vision and were willing to put the work forward. But, but between Jonathan and Jasper, I found a great crew that were in it whole headlong and, and were willing to pull off some of the crazy things I pulled off. So could not have done it without them. Yes, there was a lot of, I have the amazing ability to look calm no matter what I'm doing. And there was a lot of me at point in time just being like, I'm being calm and doing this, but I'm about to explode any moment now. And so many last minute changes and things that were planned that then got shelved and moved in other directions, you know, quite quietly and seamlessly. And yeah, there was a lot of figuring things out as we went along. And I'm just really good at keeping a straight face. What most exceeded your expectations? If I had to boil it down to one particular thing, one of the local people, and I will remain anonymous about that, but one of the local people here in town I ran into after the fact came up to me and literally said, Dev Space changed my life because as a younger computer professional meeting some of the hardened veterans I brought in as speakers and interacting with them in a personal level and seeing the way everything happens completely changed their outlook and raised their optimism to the the industry and everything. And that one comment justified everything else. That's amazing. And there were there were a few other comments we got where... What, did he go to my talk? I, I, I don't know <laughs> whose talk they went to because I didn't... One of the things I really wanted to do was, was have a way for people to give feedback on individual sessions. And yeah, that didn't happen. Um, it eventually ended up being a bulk email that went to the mailing list that said, hey... Yeah, I messed that part up. So just send me emails about what you thought was good and bad, and we'll see how that goes. So I don't know particularly who was, was in what session. Was was this a college student? That's yes, it was a college student. College student, okay. This college student went to a professional. That's actually amazing in itself, a college student going to a professional developer-oriented conference. I mean, that right there shows that this student is about operating three or four tiers above his peers. Well, and and I want to run that to a corollary of something that's a long-term goal for the conference, but something that's actively going on now in some of the other conferences. And the particular conference I want to single out is a conference that's out of Wisconsin in uh, August that I go to every year called That Conference. That Conference? That Conference. They They have, since day one, had a kids' track where... A vol- volunteers come in and give sessions oriented towards the families of the attendees, and you know the the families get to come for free. Where you know it's like building simple electronics with you know play doh and and wires and stuff, or Lego Mindstorms or simple robotic projects. You know a lot of kit things, whatever. Um, but get the families involved, and they did that year one, and then year two they expanded it a little more to. To saying, hey, when you when the speakers do your sessions, if your family's there, go ahead and let your family sit on your session so they can see what you do, which then evolved over time to where now it's, yes, there's the family track, but anybody with a ticket, whether it be the actual attendee or the spouse or the child or whatever, has full range to go to absolutely any session they want. Okay. On top of this, so go back to year one. I think they just got done with year four, if not year five. I think it's year four, though. Parent brought their child, not trying to say, I want you to become a geek, but to say, I want you to learn the value of learning and and lifelong learning. That's always the goal for college. And not college. Eight-year-old at the time. Eight-year-old? Eight-year-old. Eight-year-old going to develop. Eight-year-old went going to a developer conference. Okay, I totally missed that. I was was visualizing. I was so blown away by what happened and what happened there that the next year 
when she came back with her child, the daughter said, you know, I see what all these people are doing. I want to try to do something. So she did an open space on Perfect. scratch programming. That then led to year three, she actually submitted a session and got accepted as a speaker. So at 10, she was a full-blown speaker. 10. At last year. That's great. So a couple months ago, because of the success of all that and that whole story, her and her mom actually shared doing a family keynote. So at 11 years old, okay, she may be 12 now, but you know, we were right in that framework. She went from having no interest in computers to her mom showing her, hey, this is, you know, this is, we do this not just for the technology, but for the community and for the lifelong learning and the, the sharing the love to becoming fully invested in the community and delivering her own keynote just because of the power of that community. And you start seeing stories like that and you're like, yeah, I want to do something down like that down here. Can you imagine, because I think of my own career and I didn't really start hitting software development pretty hard till maybe... 12 years ago, maybe my mid to late 20s. If I had started when I was 11, you know, I'd have an additional 11 years experience. So she is going to be an absolute wizard by the time she gets even started on her post-college career. She's already very good, all things <laughs> considered. Um, I, I was fortunate that my dad had a computer laying around the house. I got to start programming at about 8 and had always been tinkering around, which is, I think, another reason why I got so dissatisfied with computer science curriculum. Right, but you probably didn't have professional guidance with, not, people, not with a, a peer group. Not a single bit. But There's value in that. that uh, there is value to that. I, I don't even think we really ever had a computer club or anything in any of the schools I went to, which is why I think when I discovered the community, and when I really discovered that community, is I think I'd gone to, to Tech Ed a couple times uh, previously before that, but that conference, referring to Tech Ed, not that conference, Tech Ed is so large that it is difficult to have that sense of community year one unless you find somebody who's in the community that drags you into a kicking and screaming. On a whim, not really on a whim, but on a, on a happenstance, let's say, uh, I stumbled into a ticket for DevLink one of their first years back when it was still in Nashville which was much smaller at that time, and that's when I really then got in that close community conference feeling and went, oh, this is what it's like to be around a group of, a true group of peers. Because for as much as the programming and technology and raw geekiness of this town, nobody talks to each other. And we're doing a really good job of working on that with things like Tech 256 and all that, but one of the things I knew coming into doing dev space was that I would have a severe problem with attendance if I couldn't penetrate into Redstone Arsenal and get those guys to come out. One of my things I wanted to do was to bring that community to them since they don't get a chance to get out. And that was one of the things I ultimately failed in doing. I never did find a way to get good penetration into Redstone Arsenal and bring all those, all those type of programmers out. Um, hopefully now with some word of mouth we can kind of bring them out next year. But I think if we can get them involved in the community, that then we would really have something we can show here. With year one out of the way and you learning all these lessons from logistics from year one, what do you think are going to be your biggest obstacles with year two? Scale and meeting expectations. The the <clears throat> With year one, we had a small group of attendees that show up that showed up but we did really well with what we had it is invariably going to be they're going to go tell their friends and we're going to get better at marketing and it's going to get bigger so are we ready for that next bump in scale it's one of the reasons using some of the feedback we want to move into the south hall to keep things better laid out and whatnot those rooms are much bigger than i had to to play with at a in the North Hall, but it has the benefit of being right next to the conference hotel. So I, th I think that will be the biggest thing is with 100 people total, and to be truthful about that, that was like 30 speakers and 70 attendees. Is that speaker heavy? It, it is and it isn't. The reason why I keep saying we had 100 people is because, yeah, the speakers didn't necessarily pay. 
when, when they came in, they were only speaking, except for one person who I specifically asked, and he was a friend of mine that had three talks I really wanted, nobody spoke more than twice. So out of 11 sessions, you were only a speaker for at most two of them, and you got to be an attendee the rest. So out of 100 people, only five people were out at any point in time. So I had about 100 people. Okay. That, that's, that's the way I, I justified that number. Do you have um, particular metrics you're shooting for for year two, or are you just crossing your fingers? Year two, I want to break even. <laughs> well, I mean, as, are you wanting, okay, so year one was, was 150, that was your goal. For year two, are you saying, okay, I'm going for 300, or are you, are you just going to see what happens? My, how, how, does that, how does that roadmap look? I, I would like to have it be a larger attendance, which is true. I still think 200 is pretty good, which is, you know, I, I, I sold out year one at 400. I knew that was never going to happen. That number was arbitrarily picked because originally at the Westin, that was the capacity of the space. And then we just kept it, even though I could have gotten more people up into the North Hall. Uh, truth be told, I probably could have gotten about 700 people up in the North Hall and still both in fire code. No way that was going to happen. And I don't aspire to be that big, especially not year one. Maybe year five we could be that big, but that <clears throat> I'm not shooting for quantity, I'm shooting for quality. Having said that, if you keep the quality up, the quantity will go up because more people want to get there and there's a supply and demand issue. And it's we had... Three people, myself and Jonathan and Jasper, who did a wonderful job trying to handle what we did this year. We had a few people volunteer that just didn't show up. But if we do scale up, there's a lot of logistical things that have to go with that scale, and we need to make sure we're prepared for that. We can't have, hey, yeah, I'd like to come volunteer and help you out, and then have them not show up. We can't have these types of things because then it will really run, run amok. We were able to pull it off this year with the small crew because it was a smaller size. So that, that is the biggest issue we have coming into year two, is we built up a reputation and put on a good event. It will attract more people. I don't want to arbitrarily <clears throat> reduce the number of attendees just so that I can deal with the scale. And it's not that I'm going to shoot the moon and say, I have space for what I think the ballrooms there can 100, can, there's five ballrooms in the South Hall. They each can, can get 150 people at their max configuration. So that's 750 people there. Not to mention you can expand that more because not everybody's going to go to every session. Plus there's the open spaces and whatnot. I don't want to shoot for that thousand people. I will probably leave sell out at 400. I will be happy with 200. But if that gauge starts going up, you have to deal with how do you deal with that scale. What was something that you thought would go well with that space but didn't? Something that I thought would go well, was, or something I thought that would, that would go better, was the open spaces. And I know the reason why it didn't go as well as it could have was because we didn't have the attendance numbers. So when you've got five concurrent speakers on top of the, the open spaces, if I only have 100 people there... There's just not the, the traffic to take advantage of it the way we wanted to. I knew, but when I was doing my initial budgets and in later analysis I was correct, I knew I needed to get about 150 to 200 people to break even money-wise. How many did you have? Uh, we were just under 100. Um, so 50-person gap? Yeah, 50-person gap. But you fill those extra bodies in there, and that's when you have more people to fill into the open spaces and becomes more viable. There was also some positioning elements with it. I wasn't 100% happy with the space at North Hall. Uh, I did like the fact that it was a closed hallway that was a loop because it kind of forced people together. But we misjudged where the congregation spots would be, so it, it didn't drive people to the open spaces like we should. We're, we're talking to the VBC for next year about getting the – ballrooms down in the south hall so that we have those five rooms right next to each other and then we can have the open spaces right outside the door and then all the registration and sponsors and everything can be just slightly down the, the hallway from it and I think that will help really drive those conversations we're looking at. Marketing, scale, and rethinking how to implement the open spaces. Those are priority improvements for the next dev space. Let's hear the postmortem from Barcamp. We had two years we could look back on. 
So back to Jason. Is there anything in particular that you learned from year one that you applied to year two? Really to follow the, the, the bar camp thing. And, you know, everyone that, you know, addressed me on not following the, the traditional bar camp style of, of an event, um, I spoke too openly. I've been a very transparent guy through the entire process. So, um, you know, just to kind of follow the, the true meaning of a bar camp and, and just continue to be open with the community. And I've, I've expressed this at both events, you know, of having other people involved in it. You know, so it's not just my event. I, you know, I would like it to evolve into, into more. Are you already working on year three? Yeah, I, I've started looking for, you know, other venues because, again, the first year we were downtown Huntsville, um, and people liked that. Um, there were limitations of some of the spaces as far as room capacity is concerned. Going to, you know, a venue like BizTech, we had plenty of the facilities were there, but I think it kind of took away some of the, the bar, relaxed. Bar, bar yeah, feel. Yeah, bar feel to it. Um, so there's, I've started looking at some other venues and of course everyone in Huntsville uh, is familiar with the uh, the Stone Middle School projects. Yes. Um, and there's a couple different avenues that are down there. There's there's lots a couple, of microbreweries. Yeah, there's a couple microbreweries. Um, there's a, a local bar that's moving in there. And then that the organization that's running that lot is also has, you know, venue space there that they can rent out as well. So, is there anything um, in particular about bar camp, either one, either year one or year two, that you thought was going to go well but didn't? The first year we had it down at uh, two bars that were roughly a block and a half away, but they were kind of around the corner. And Yes. Um, I was bouncing back and forth between the two, but the first year I noticed that the group that was at the first bar stayed at the first bar and then the second group stayed at the second bar and very few people I saw get up and, and walk between um, so that that made it a little more difficult and kind of maybe influenced my reasoning of moving it out of downtown uh, the set for the second year um, the second year went off you know pretty well I mean there was some behind the scenes stuff that was no really no fault of anyone's it's just a matter of getting those stars to line up, you know, took some time. And Do you think the voting went off well? Um, there, there was a, an exception that people trying to vote for the same talk twice came up as, a, as an issue, so um, we didn't have any... You said that was allowed, I remember. I, again, one of those things, <laughs> as we all know, you, you test for stuff and it... You know, it tends well, to, to you know, leak through. But Well, I'm not going to name names, but I can think of at least one person that voted twice for one talk. Okay. So maybe I wasn't doing sanitization on the, you know, you know, on the front end that the back end wasn't liking. But there were some issues that we were able to kind of, you know, work out. But overall, it went off without a hitch. We didn't have any, you know, I, the I, website didn't crash or anything like that. So. I thought it went very smoothly. I was very impressed. With B-Sides, we looked into creating a nonprofit corporation to oversee it. There are pros and cons. We decided it was just too much hassle. Jason said he decided the same for Bar Camp. However, Chris is actually going through the process of creating a nonprofit for DevSpace. Let's hear why he decided that path. I was I was curious on to why you went the nonprofit route, because I imagine that ties your hands on what you can do. It does tie your hands in some respects in the fact that <clears throat> the way you, you deal with paying people completely changes, the way you, you deal with uh, certain aspects of contracts completely changes. There's some benefits in the fact that if you have the right vendors, you don't have to pay taxes on the money coming in. You can set up things with like Office Depot and Staples where you're not paying taxes on the supplies you're getting. So it can be six of one, half dozen the other. Um, some of the conferences I knew went that route, and I figured that would be the, the path of least resistance. I shouldn't say path of least resistance. It's a pain in the to actually do it. Do but but it, it gave me an opportunity that, especially with 
Jonathan, who's on our board of directors, we actually have a scale bigger in mind than just the conference. And to pull off that scale of other things we want to do after we can establish ourselves, the nonprofit will come in to help. So DevSpace may become a brand that you use in other places? Well, the original concept wasn't just to do the conference. The conference was part of it, but we wanted to build something that would actually help build the local community and get the local groups talking. Um, on top of just being something that could run the conference and bring a huge influx into town to, to see what's going on there, we wanted to be able to do things where we could support all the independent users groups and maybe help them you know, get spaces where they can have their meetings on a regular basis and, and give them away so that these different groups can talk to each other. If they're doing things on different days and we can maybe help them bring a speaker in town that can hit more than one group and, and kind of overarch over things. We wanted to do things where we could get involved with the high schools and maybe help with scholarships or mentorship and things like that. We really wanted to extend it past just the conference. The conference is just the thing we knew that if we pulled off would give us the attention we needed to pull off the other things. This sounds like a whole pile of work that you're proposing and a very large grand vision. Are you, do you hope that eventually, uh, we'll just call it devspace.org for lack of a better term. We own devspace.org. You do? We do. Do you anticipate that you going to work for them and offering you a salary so you can do this kind of thing all well, the time? Well, theoretically speaking, no, because we put it in the bylaws that none of the uh, board of directors or officers of the corporation get paid. Um, so this, <laughs> <laughs> Do you enjoy working for nothing all the time? Um, I do if... I, I'm not doing it for the money, and I never was doing it for the money. And believe it or not, I wasn't doing it for the glory. The... Sure, pulling off a conference and getting introduced to new people because of it and whatnot has helped in certain ways, but I did it because I love giving back to the community and I love interacting with people and doing all these types of things. And as long as I'm still doing that, I'm fine. If that becomes a point where I can no longer successfully manage it, but I can muster through enough for a couple of years to establish everything like we want to, I can stay on the board of directors, I can have a new chairman come in, to actually run the organization, I can say in an advisory way, if we actually start to pull off some of the conferences and initiatives we're actually trying to pull off, we'll be able to actually, and we can amend the bylaws if necessary, to pay somebody to actually run the thing. But I don't have to be the guy in charge forever. I can be the guy who had the passion to jumpstart it, and then it can filter off into three different Committee, so to speak, and other people can run those committees, and I can be advisory. This guidance over arching group that you're talking about seems like it has a lot of crossover with the open Huntsville thing going on right now. Have you considered joining forces with them? Uh, I am hoping at one point in time we can. Right now I have to get out of the, I am just a holding organization to run a conference and, and actually get some of that capital build up and, and wait to be able to do something. It so happened that when I conceived Dev Space, Open Huntsville was in its conception and we both kind of came up with the same idea at the same time. Uh, so, so and I was fine with that because they were doing a lot of the community stuff that I wanted to do long term, whereas I was doing the big conference up front so I think there is a lot of synergy and a lot that we could do to really work with Open Huntsville in the future. And uh, I don't know exactly what their organizational structure is, but I, I mean, we can definitely pull them under as a nonprofit. If our nonprofit status comes in, I can shell them out as something to, to give them umbrella status to, and, and we can really work together to do things. Do they know about your interest? Have you talked to them? I mean, if I broadcast this, is it's going to be brand new. It might be. I, I've mentioned it before to people. Because I'm happy to cut this part out. And No. <laughs> when I announced the conference before I had any plans, why would I do any different now? So. Previously on My Code is Broken. So Open Huntsville is no longer just a website. It's more of a brand that you're taking off of a website and sprinkling everywhere. Right, so there's still a lot of thoughts on this front, and we're still figuring it out. Open Huntsville is becoming a brand 
And under that brand, we hope to facilitate or foster other people doing kind of like what we did for Open Huntsville, the website, which is form small project teams and implement a project management strategy and have a project manager and launch communities, you know, websites or projects or startups, that kind of thing. Every respectable conference needs a website. When you have no budget, you create it yourself. B-Side's website is a single-page site based on Twitter Bootstrap. There are hard-coded PHP arrays for speakers and sponsors. I then loop over the arrays to populate the content. A little bit of code makes updating a lot easier. DevSpace was built using ASP.NET and Azure. Beyond that, anything I tell you may be outdated because Chris is planning a rewrite. The code powering Barcamp was an interesting conversation because Jason considers himself more of a sysadmin than a web developer. Let's listen to that audio. My career path kind of took me down more of the, you know, systems role and not out of the web development role. So the last time I did any hardcore web development was Cold Fusion when Cold Fusion oh, was still a thing. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, you know. Did you write the Barcamp website? Yeah. Um, and I, I just picked up Django, so, you know, doing some Python in my, you know, day-to-day -day job, I was familiar with it and, and picked that up. And, and uh, used HTML5 up as your template. Yeah, so the, you know, saw that on the Tech256 Group's website and, uh, you know, looked like it would accomplish the, the task at hand, so. And uh, even at that, I was having to, to take their, their components of both websites that I liked, or, or two templates that I liked, so merging their JavaScript and CSS and things like that, I had to kind of dust off a part of my brain that had web development stuff left left in there, so. How much um, web development experience did you have before tackling Barcamp, huntsville.org? Uh, don't know how, how much of a scale, but I did, did quite a few websites, you know, just like realtor websites and things like that, but, you know, that was before a lot of the MLS integration and stuff came along, but I'd worked for a motorcycle promotions company and actually did their, their front end uh, website and then took their paper process and all, you know, digitized it through a, uh, like an internet portal. So they did all of their accounting, um, you know, sponsorship, registration, ticket sales, and did kind of all that stuff back in early 2000s. So all cold fusion driven and so 15 years later you're putting together a, a yeah. bar camp site yeah. <laughs> so, yeah so well i don't want to pull up any website that i put together back in 2000 it, yeah. it would not be pleasant either that that was back when you had to layer tables on top of tables to, yeah. to get some kind of yeah. formatting going and nesting tables i remember <laughs> oh it was it was nice yeah. <laughs> With the time remaining, here are some parting words from Chris Gardner and then Jason Sumner. With the um, few minutes I have, do you have a pitch or a statement that you want to throw in? Hey, my pitch is we're going to, Dev Space will be coming out next year. Uh, we kind of put it on stasis for the end of the year since we killed ourselves getting everything set up. January 1, we're going to start playing again. Call for sponsors will come up. Probably beginning of February, we'll start doing call for speakers, probably middle to end of March, beginning of April, something like that. Kind of give ourselves the room to breathe. Do it right this time, now that we're not fighting, getting licenses and things like that. So my pitch is keep track, devspaceconf.com. That's the website. That's the Twitter account. That's the Facebook account. Do you have a, do you have something you want to pitch? No, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm... Are you trying to recruit volunteers? Volunteers would be excellent. And, uh, you know, I, like I said at the, the events, you know, live, I don't want it to be a patriarchal type event to where my influence is the only influence that leads, you know, the event. Um, so there's, there's that part of me that wants it to be, you know, truly community-driven. So, I mean, you know, any volunteers that want to, you know, take it on, but... As you've discussed in your previous episodes, you know, where you talked about project failures, like I don't want, I'd hate to see it go down the road of 30 people, you know, trying to put on the event, but 
I think a, a small you know group of people you know could pull off the event and and do it pretty well. And that's the show. I hope you like the new format. A big thank you to their guests. Find me at Nagel Code. Find Jason Sumner at Bar Camp HSV. Find Chris Gardner at Freestyle Coder. As for the websites, Bar Camp Huntsville is at barcamphuntsville.org. DevSpace is at devspaceconf.com. B-Sides Huntsville is at bsideshuntsville.org. All the sites and Twitter accounts will be linked in the show notes. Until next time, this is My Code is Broken, and I'm Dan Nagel, signing off. I was going to ask you about Microsoft and your undying love for it, but we're out of time. Ah. <laughs> Another time. Another time. Another. All right, thank you. That was You're great. Welcome.